Part three, chapter one of Madame Bovary by Gustave Flaubert, translated by Eleanor Mark Saverling. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Part three, chapter one. Monsieur Léon, while studying the law, had gone pretty often to the dancing rooms, where he was even a great success among the grisettes, who thought he had a distinguished air. He was the best-mannered of the students. He wore his hair neither too long nor too short, didn't spend all his quarter's money on the first day of the month, and kept on good terms with his professors. As for excesses, he had always abstained from them, as much from cowardice as from refinement. Often when he stayed in his room to read, or else when sitting of an evening under the lime-trees of the Luxembourg, he let his code fall to the ground, and the memory of Emma came back to him. But gradually this feeling grew weaker, and other desires gathered over it, although it still persisted through them all. For Léon did not lose all hope. There was for him, as it were, a vague promise floating in the future, like a golden fruit suspended from some fantastic tree. Then, seeing her again after three years of absence, his passion reawakened. He must, he thought, at last make up his mind to possess her. Moreover, his timidity had worn off by contact with his gay companions, and he returned to the provinces, despising every one who had not, with varnished shoes, trodden the asphalt of the boulevards. By the side of a Parisienne in her laces, in the drawing-room of some illustrious physician, a person driving his carriage and wearing many orders, the poor clerk would no doubt have trembled like a child. But here, at Rouen, on the harbour, with the wife of this small doctor, he felt at his ease, sure beforehand he would shine. Self-possession depends on its environment. We don't speak on the first floor as on the fourth, and the wealthy woman seems to have about her to guard her virtue all her banknotes, like a cuirass in the lining of her corset. On leaving the Bovaries the night before, Léon had followed them through the streets at a distance. Then, having seen them stop at the Croix Rouge, he turned on his heel and spent the night meditating a plan. So, the next day, about five o'clock, he walked into the kitchen of the inn with a choking sensation in his throat, pale cheeks, and that resolution of cowards that stops at nothing. "'The gentleman isn't in,' answered a servant. This seemed to him a good omen. He went upstairs. She was not disturbed at his approach. On the contrary, she apologised for having neglected to tell him where they were staying. "'Oh, I divined it,' said Léon. He pretended he had been guided towards her by chance, by instinct. She began to smile, and at once, to repair his folly, Léon told her that he had spent his morning in looking for her in all the hotels in the town, one after the other. "'So you have made up your mind to stay,' he added. "'Yes,' she said, "'and I am wrong. One ought not to accustom oneself to impossible pleasures when there are a thousand demands upon one.' "'Oh, I can imagine. Oh, no, for you, you are a man.' But men, too, had had their trials, and the conversation went off into certain philosophical reflections. Emma expatiated much on the misery of earthly affections, and the eternal isolation in which the heart remains entombed. To show off, or from a naive imitation of this melancholy which called forth his, the young man declared that he had been awfully bored during the whole course of his studies. The law irritated him, other vocations attracted him, and his mother never ceased worrying him in every one of her letters. As they talked, they explained more and more fully the motives of their sadness, working themselves up in their progressive confidence. But they sometimes stopped short of the complete exposition of their thought, and then sought to invent a phrase that might express it all the same. She did not confess her passion for another, he did not say he had forgotten her. Perhaps he no longer remembered his suppers with girls after masked balls, and no doubt she did not recollect the rendezvous of old when she ran across the fields in the morning to her lover's house. 
The noises of the town hardly reached them, and the room seemed small, as if on purpose to hem in their solitude more closely. Emma, in a dimity dressing gown, leant her head against the back of the old armchair. The yellow wallpaper formed, as it were, a golden background behind her, and her bare head was mirrored in the glass with the white parting in the middle and the tip of her ears peeping out from the folds of her hair. "'But pardon me,' she said. "'It is wrong of me. I weary you with my eternal complaints.' "'No, never, never.' If you knew, she went on, raising to the ceiling her beautiful eyes, in which a tear was trembling, all that I had dreamed. And I, oh, I too have suffered. Often I went out, I went away. I dragged myself along the quays, seeking distraction amid the din of the crowd, without being able to banish the heaviness that weighed upon me. In an engraver's shop on the boulevard there is an Italian print of one of the muses, she is draped in a tunic, and she is looking at the moon, with forget-me-nots in her flowing hair. Something drove me there continually. I stayed there hours together. Then, in a trembling voice, she resembled you a little. Madame Bovary turned away her head, that he might not see the irrepressible smile she felt rising to her lips. Often, he went on, I wrote you letters that I tore up. She did not answer. He continued, I sometimes fancied that some chance would bring you. I thought I recognised you at street corners, and I ran after all the carriages through whose windows I saw a shawl fluttering, a veil like yours. She seemed resolved to let him go on speaking without interruption. Crossing her arms and bending down her face, she looked at the rosettes on her slippers, and at intervals made little movements inside the satin of them with her toes. At last she sighed. But the most wretched thing, is it not, is to drag out, as I do, a useless existence. If our pains were only of some use to someone, we should find consolation in the thought of the sacrifice. He started off in praise of virtue, duty, and silent immolation, having himself an incredible longing for self-sacrifice that he could not satisfy. I should much like, she said, to be a nurse at a hospital. Alas, men have none of these holy missions, and I see nowhere any calling unless perhaps that of a doctor. With a slight shrug of her shoulders, Emma interrupted him to speak of her illness, which had almost killed her. What a pity she should not be suffering now. Léon at once envied the calm of the tomb, and one evening he had even made his will, asking to be buried in that beautiful rug with velvet stripes he had received from her. For this was how they would have wished to be, each setting up an ideal to which they were now adapting their past life. Besides, speech is a rolling mill that always thins out the sentiment. But at this invention of the rug, she asked, But why? Why? He hesitated. Because I loved you so. And congratulating himself at having surmounted the difficulty, Léon watched her face out of the corner of his eyes. It was like the sky when a gust of wind drives the clouds across. The mass of sad thoughts that darkened them seemed to be lifted from her blue eyes. Her whole face shone. He waited. At last, she replied, I always suspected it. Then they went over all the trifling events of that far-off existence whose joys and sorrows they had just summed up in one word. They recalled the arbour with Clematis, the dresses she had worn, the furniture of her room, the whole of her house. And our poor cactuses, where are they? The cold killed them this winter. And how I have thought of them, do you know? I often saw them again as of yore, when on the summer mornings the sun beat down upon your blinds, and I saw your two bare arms passing out amongst the flowers. Poor friend, she said, holding out her hand to him. Leon swiftly pressed his lips to it. Then, when he had taken a deep breath, at that time you were to me, I know not what incomprehensible force that took captive my life. Once, for instance, I went to see you, but you no doubt do not remember it. 
I do, she said. Go on. You were downstairs in the ante-room, ready to go out, standing on the last stair. You were wearing a bonnet with small blue flowers, and without any invitation from you, in spite of myself, I went with you. Every moment, however, I grew more and more conscious of my folly, and I went on walking by you, not daring to follow you completely, and unwilling to leave you. When you went into a shop, I waited in the street, and I watched you through the windows, taking off your gloves and counting the change on the counter. Then you rang at Madame Tuvache's. You were let in, and I stood like an idiot in front of the great heavy door that had closed after you. Madame Bovary, as she listened to him, wondered that she was so old. All these things reappearing before her seemed to widen out her life, and it was like some sentimental immensity to which she returned. And from time to time she said in a low voice, her eyes half closed, Yes, it is true, true, true. They heard eight strike on the different clocks of the Beauvoisine quarter, which is full of schools, churches and large empty hotels. They no longer spoke, but they felt as they looked upon each other a buzzing in their heads, as if something sonorous had escaped from the fixed eyes of each of them. They were hand in hand now, and the past, the future, reminiscences and dreams, all were confounded in the sweetness of this ecstasy. Night was darkening over the walls, on which still shone, half hidden in the shade, the coarse colours of four bills, representing four scenes from the Tour de Nail, with a motto in Spanish and French at the bottom. Through the sash window a patch of dark sky was seen between the pointed roofs. She rose to light two wax candles on the drawers. Then she sat down again. Well, said Léon. Well, she replied. He was thinking how to resume the interrupted conversation when she said to him, How is it that no one until now has ever expressed such sentiments to me? The clerk said that ideal natures were difficult to understand. He, from the first moment, had loved her, and he despaired when he thought of the happiness that would have been theirs if, thanks to fortune meeting her earlier, they had been indissolubly bound to one another. I have sometimes thought of it, she went on. What a dream, murmured Léon. And fingering gently the blue binding of her long white sash, he added, And who prevents us from beginning now? No, my friend, she replied, I am too old, you are too young. Forget me, others will love you, you will love them. Not as you, he cried. What a child you are, come, let us be sensible, I wish it. She showed him the impossibility of their love, and that they must remain, as formerly, on the simple terms of a fraternal friendship. Was she speaking thus seriously? No doubt Emma did not herself know, quite absorbed as she was by the charm of the seduction and the necessity of defending herself from it, and contemplating the young man with a moved look, she gently repulsed the timid caresses that his trembling hands attempted. Ah, oh, forgive me, he cried, drawing back. Emma was seized with a vague fear at this shyness, more dangerous to her than the boldness of Rodolphe when he advanced to her open-armed. No man had ever seemed to her so beautiful. An exquisite candour emanated from his being. He lowered his long, fine eyelashes that curled upwards. His cheek with the soft skin reddened, she thought, with desire of her person and Emma felt an invincible longing to press her lips to it. Then, leaning towards the clock as if to see the time, Ah, oh, how late it is, she said, how we do chatter. He understood the hint and took up his hat. It has even made me forget the theatre, and Paul Bovary has left me here especially for that. Monsieur Lomeau of the Rue Grand Pont was to take me and his wife and the opportunity was lost as she was to leave the next day. Really, said Léon? Yes. 
But I must see you again, he went on. I wanted to tell you what? Something important, serious. Oh, no. Besides, you will not go. It is impossible. If you should listen to me, then you have not understood me. You have not guessed. Yet you speak plainly, said Emma. Ah, you can jest. Enough, enough. Oh, for pity's sake, let me see you once. Only once. Well, she stopped then, as if thinking better of it. Oh, not here. Where you will. Will you? She seemed to reflect then abruptly. Tomorrow, at eleven o'clock, in the cathedral. I shall be there, he cried, seizing her hands, which she disengaged. And as they were both standing up, he behind her and Emma with her head bent, he stooped over her and pressed long kisses on her neck. You're mad, you're mad, she said with sounding little laughs, while the kisses multiplied. Then bending his head over her shoulders, he seemed to beg the consent of her eyes. They fell upon him, full of an icy dignity. They all stepped back to go out. He stopped on the threshold, then he whispered with a trembling voice, Tomorrow. She answered with a nod and disappeared like a bird into the next room. In the evening, Emma wrote the clerk an interminable letter in which she cancelled the rendezvous. All was over. They must not, for the sake of their happiness, meet again. But when the letter was finished, as she did not know Léon's address, she was puzzled. I'll give it to him myself, she said. He will come. The next morning at the open window and humming on his balcony, Léon himself varnished his pumps with several coatings. He put on white trousers, fine socks, a green coat, emptied all the scent he had into his handkerchief. Then, having had his hair curled, he uncurled it again in order to give it a more natural elegance. It is still too early, he thought, looking at the hairdresser's cuckoo clock that pointed to the hour of nine. He read an old-fashioned journal, went out, smoked a cigar, walked up three streets, thought it was time, and went slowly towards the porch of Notre Dame. It was a beautiful summer morning. Silver plate sparkled in the jeweller's windows, and the light falling obliquely on the cathedral made mirrors of the corners of the grey stones. A flock of birds fluttered in the grey sky round the trefoil bell turrets. The square, resounding with cries, was fragrant with the flowers that bordered its pavement, roses, jasmines, pinks, narcissi, and tube-roses, unevenly spaced out between moist grasses, catmint, and chickweed for the birds. The fountains gurgled in the centre, and under large umbrellas, amidst melons, piled up in heaps, flower-women, bareheaded, were twisting paper round bunches of violets. The young man took one. It was the first time that he had bought flowers for a woman, and his breast, as he smelt them, swelled with pride, as if this homage that he meant for another had recoiled upon himself. But he was afraid of being seen. He resolutely entered the church. The beadle, who was just then standing on the threshold in the middle of the left doorway under the dancing Marianne with feather cap and rapier dangling against his calves, came in more majestic than a cardinal and as shining as a saint on a holy pyx. He came towards Léon, and with that smile of wheedling benignity assumed by ecclesiastics when they question children, the gentleman, no doubt, does not belong to these parts. The gentleman would like to see the curiosities of the church? No, said the other. And he first went round the lower aisles. Then he went out to look at the place. Emma was not coming yet. He went up again to the choir. The nave was reflected in the full fonts with the beginning of the arches and some portions of the glass windows but the reflections of the paintings, broken by the marble rim, were continued farther on upon the flagstones like a many-coloured carpet. The broad daylight from without streamed into the church in three enormous rays from the three opened portals. From time to time at the upper end a sacristan passed, making the oblique genuflection of devout persons in a hurry. The crystal lustres hung motionless. 
In the choir a silver lamp was burning, and from the side chapels and dark places of the church sometimes rose sounds like sighs, with the clang of a closing grating, its echo reverberating under the lofty vault. Léon, with solemn steps, walked along by the walls. Life had never seemed so good to him. She would come directly, charming, agitated, looking back at the glances that followed her, and with her flounced dress, her gold eyeglass, her thin shoes, with all sorts of elegant trifles that he had never enjoyed, and with the ineffable seduction of yielding virtue. The church, like a huge boudoir, spread around her. The arches bent down to gather in the shade the confession of her love. The windows shone resplendent to illumine her face, and the censers would burn that she might appear like an angel amid the fumes of the sweet-smelling odours. But she did not come. He sat down on a chair, and his eyes fell upon a blue-stained window representing boatmen carrying baskets. He looked at it long, attentively, and he counted the scales of the fishes and the buttonholes of the doublets while his thoughts wandered off towards Emma. The beadle, standing aloof, was inwardly angry at this individual who took the liberty of admiring the cathedral by himself. He seemed to him to be conducting himself in a monstrous fashion, to be robbing him in a sort, and almost committing sacrilege. But a rustle of silk on the flags, the tip of a bonnet, a lined cloak, it was she. Léon rose and ran to meet her. Emma was pale. She walked fast. Read, she said, holding out a paper to him. Oh, no! and she abruptly withdrew her hand to enter the chapel of the Virgin, where, kneeling on a chair, she began to pray. The young man was irritated at this bigot fancy. Then he nevertheless experienced a certain charm in seeing her in the middle of a rendezvous, thus lost in her devotions like an Andalusian marchioness. Then he grew bored, for she seemed never coming to an end. Emma prayed or rather strove to pray, hoping that some sudden resolution might descend to her from heaven, and to draw down divine aid, she filled full her eyes with the splendours of the tabernacle. She breathed in the perfumes of the full-blown flowers in the large vases, and listened to the stillness of the church that only heightened the tumult of her heart. She rose, and they were about to leave, when the beadle came forward, hurriedly saying, Madame, no doubt, does not belong to these parts. Madame would like to see the curiosities of the church. Oh, no, cried the clerk. Why not, said she, for she clung with her expiring virtue to the virgin, the sculptures, the tombs, anything. Then, in order to proceed by rule, the beadle conducted them right to the entrance near the square, where, pointing out with his cane a large circle of block stones without inscription or carving, This, he said majestically, is the circumference of the beautiful bell of Amboise. It weighed forty thousand pounds. There was not its equal in all Europe. The workman who cast it died of the joy. Let us go on, said Léon. The old fellow started off again. Then, having got back to the chapel of the Virgin, he stretched forth his arm with an all-embracing gesture of demonstration, and, prouder than a country squire showing you his espaliers, went on, This simple stone covers Pierre de Braise, Lord of Varennes and of Brissac, Grand Marshal of Poitou and Governor of Normandy, who died at the Battle of Montherry on the 16th of July, 1465. Léon bit his lips, fuming. And on the right, this gentleman, all encased in iron on the prancing horse, is his grandson, Louis de Braise, Lord of Breval and of Montchevet, Count de Molevrier, Baron de Morny, Chamberlain to the King, Knight of the Order, and also Governor of Normandy, died on the 23rd of July, 1531, a Sunday, as the inscription specifies and below this figure, about to descend into the tomb, portrays the same person. It is not possible, is it, to see a more perfect representation of annihilation? Madame Bovary put up her eyeglasses. 
Léon, motionless, looked at her, no longer even attempting to speak a single word, to make a gesture. So discouraged was he at this twofold obstinacy of gossip and indifference. The everlasting guide went on. Near him, this kneeling woman who weeps is his spouse, Diane de Poitiers, Countess de Braise, Duchess de Valentinois, born in 1499, died in 1566, and to the left, the one with the child is the Holy Virgin. Now turn to this side, here are the tombs of the Amboise. They were both cardinals and archbishops of Rouen. That one was minister under Louis XII. He did a great deal for the cathedral. In his will he left 30,000 gold crowns for the poor. And without stopping, still talking, he pushed them into a chapel full of balustrades, some put away, and disclosed a kind of block that certainly might once have been an ill-made statue. Truly, he said with a groan, it adorned the tomb of Richard Coeur de Lyon, King of England and Duke of Normandy. It was the Calvinist, sir, who reduced it to this condition. They had buried it for spite in the earth, under the episcopal seat of Monseigneur. See, this is the door by which Monseigneur passes to his house. Let us pass on quickly to see the gargoyle windows. But Léon hastily took some silver from his pocket and seized Emma's arm. The beadle stood dumbfounded, not able to understand this untimely munificence when there were still so many things for the stranger to see. So calling him back, he cried, Sir, sir, the steeple, the steeple! No, thank you, said Léon. You are wrong, sir. It is four hundred and forty feet high, nine less than the great pyramid of Egypt. It is all cast. It... Léon was fleeing, for it seemed to him that his love that for nearly two hours now had become petrified in the church like the stones, would vanish like a vapour through that sort of truncated funnel of oblong cage, of open chimney that rises so grotesquely from the cathedral, like the extravagant attempt of some fantastic brazier. But where are we going? she said. Making no answer, he walked on with a rapid step, and Madame Bovary was already dipping her finger in the holy water when behind them they heard a panting breath interrupted by the regular sound of a cane. Léon turned back. Sir, what is it? And he recognised the beadle holding under his arms and balancing against his stomach some twenty large sewn volumes. They were works which treated of the cathedral. Idiot, growled Léon, rushing out of the church. A lad was playing about the close. Go and get me a cab. The child bounded off like a ball by the Rue Quatrevent. Then they were alone a few minutes, face to face and a little embarrassed. Oh, Léon, really, I don't know if I ought, she whispered. Then, with a more serious air, Do you know, it is very improper. How so, replied the clerk, it is done at Paris? And that is an irresistible argument, decided her. Still the cab did not come. Léon was afraid she might go back into the church. At last the cab appeared. At all events, go out by the north porch, cried the beadle who was left alone on the threshold, so as to see the resurrection, the last judgment, paradise, King David, and the condemned in hell flames. Where to, sir? asked the coachman. Where you like, said Léon, forcing Emma into the cab. And the lumbering machine set out. It went down the Rue Grand Pont, crossed the Place des Arts, the Quai Napoléon, the Pont Neuf, and stopped short before the statue of Pierre Corneille. Go on, cried a voice that came from within. The cab went on again, and as soon as it reached the Carrefour Lafayette, set off downhill and entered the station at a gallop. No, straight on, cried the same voice. The cab came out by the gate and soon, having reached the cours, trotted quietly beneath the elm trees. The coachman wiped his brow, put his leather hat between his knees, and drove his carriage beyond the side alley by the meadow to the margin of the waters. It went along by the river, along the towing path paved with sharp pebbles, and for a long while in the direction of Oiselle beyond the isles. 
but suddenly it turned with a dash across Quatre Mers, Sotte Ville, La Grande Chaussée, the Bout Le Boeuf, and made its third halt in front of the Jardin des Plantes. Get on, will you? cried the voice more furiously. And at once, resuming its course, it passed by saint Sever, by the Quai des Carandiers, by Quai aux Meurs, once more over the bridge, by the Place du Champ de Mar, and behind the hotel gardens, where old men in black coats were walking in the sun along the terrace, all green with ivory. It went up the boulevard Bouvreuil, along the boulevard Cauchoise, then the whole of Mont Riboudet to the Daville Hills. It came back, and then, without any fixed plan or direction, wandered about at hazard. The cab was seen at Saint Paul, at Lescure, at Mont Gargan, at La Rouge Marc, and Place du Gaillabois, in the Rue Maladrerie, Rue Dinanderie, before Saint Romain, Saint Vivien, Saint Maclou, Saint Nicaise, in front of the customs, at the Vieille Tour, the Trois Pipes, and the monumental cemetery. From time to time the coachman on his box cast despairing eyes at the public houses. He could not understand what furious desire for locomotion urged these individuals never to wish to stop. He tried to now and then, and at once exclamations of anger burst forth behind him. Then he lashed his perspiring jades afresh, but indifferent to their jolting, running up against things here and there, not caring if he did, demoralised and almost weeping with thirst, fatigue and depression. And on the harbour, in the midst of the drays and casks, and in the streets, at the corners, the good folk opened large, wonder-stricken eyes at this sight, so extraordinary in the provinces, a cab with blinds drawn, and which appeared thus constantly shut more closely than a tomb, and tossing about like a vessel. Once, in the middle of the day, in the open country, just as the sun beat most fiercely against the old plated lanterns, a bared hand passed beneath the small blinds of yellow canvas, and threw out some scraps of paper that scattered in the wind and farther off lighted like white butterflies on a field of red clover all in bloom. At about six o'clock the carriage stopped in a back street at the Beauvoisine quarter, and a woman got out, who walked with her veil down, and without turning her head. End of part three, chapter one.